Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Barbara Bacheris, representing Wayne Doty, and I've requested to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. Your Honors, Mr. Doty is asking you today to reverse his uh, sentence of death uh, and remand his case for a new penalty phase at which the uh, jury can be instructed on the correct burden of proof to be applied to certain findings that, uh, that had to be made before death could be imposed. Um, as the court is, is familiar, this is Mr. Doty's uh, second sentence of death. He was uh, initially uh, given a death sentence uh, based on a non-unanimous jury recommendation and then was resentenced following uh, Hearst v. State. Um, however, the, the main issue that he raises on appeal is the instruction uh, of the jury on, the, on what has to be found beyond a reasonable doubt before death can be imposed under the current Florida statute. Your Honors, um, and as you're, you're very familiar, in 2016, uh, the Florida legislature made some significant changes to Florida's death penalty statute in response to the Supreme Court decision of Hearst v. Florida. Hearst v. Florida said that the Florida statute previously in existence was unconstitutional because it allowed judicial fact-finding. Uh, of certain key uh, issues, particularly uh, the existence of aggravating circumstances justifying the death penalty. In response to that decision, the Florida legislature made some significant changes to the death penalty statute and put several key findings squarely in the hands of the jury so that now we have a system where before death can even be considered, the jury has to go through several steps, make findings on those steps, and then recommend death. And only if those things happen does the court then exercise its discretion to impose death or to give the defendant life in prison without possibility of release. Um, those steps are, first, that one or more aggravators have been proved, aggravating factors. Second, that the aggravators are sufficient to justify death. And third, that they outweigh any mitigating evidence that's presented. Um, and it's our position that under Hearst v. State, under Perry, and, and under Supreme Court case law, that because those findings are in the hands of the jury, they must be made beyond a reasonable doubt by a unanimous jury. The unanimity requirement, as you know, was not actually added to the statute until 2017 following Hearst v. State. But now we have findings that must be made by the jury. We have a requirement of unanimity. And hand in hand with that goes the requirement that these findings be made beyond a reasonable doubt. Hearst v. State, though, did not require that those findings, other than the whether there was an aggravating factor, be made beyond a reasonable doubt, correct? Uh, not, I don't agree with that, Your Honor. If which you, part if of the you opinion says? Hearst, which part of the opinion says that it mentions beyond a reasonable doubt with regard to those other facts that need to be found by the jury? What Hearst v. State does, Your Honor, is it, it distinguishes between findings that the jury makes and recommendations. And Hearst acknowledges that that under the Apprendi line of cases, findings that increase the maximum penalty have to be found beyond a reasonable doubt. Didn't Hearst specifically use the beyond a reasonable doubt language only with regard to the first fact that has to be found by the jury, whether in, there was an aggravator? In one of the statements of the case is holding, yes, Your Honor, you're correct. It okay. referred specifically to that. Of course, that makes sense in the context of the statute that had been invalidated. How can one make uh, beyond a reasonable doubt? How can one assign a, a certainty level to a factor like mercy or to a weight weighing one versus another? How, how, does, okay. how are those susceptible to a standard of proof, whether it's beyond a reasonable doubt, preponderance of the evidence, or whatever? I, I believe those two factors are treated differently under the statute and, and can constitutionally be treated differently. So that the jury's ultimate recommendation of death or life is the so-called mercy determination. And that is not susceptible, as you said, to a, a specific burden of proof. What about weight? But, what about but where the you weighing, weigh? The weighing is, and in fact, the, that weighing decision is um, subject to that burden of proof in a number of other jurisdictions and, and other, um, other decisions as well. I know well. other jurisdictions say it, but I'm, I'm talking about just a matter of practice. How would, when, when you're asked to weigh one versus another, and you're saying one weighs more than the other, how is that susceptible to beyond a reasonable doubt or preponderance? It either because does or does not weigh. It's a, it's a, because, Your it's Honor, a judgment that, call. 
it, it, the, the weighing itself is a judgment call, yes. The state of certitude that has to be brought to that ultimate recommendation does is something that can to, be, I'm does sorry, a jury, Does a jury have to unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt a mitigator before it can be considered and weighed? No, Your Honor. Why not? Because uh, a mitigator does not raise the available statutory maximum penalty. A mitigator receives how, how, from... How can you say when, that when the finding of a mitigator, whether someone individually considers something as a mitigating circumstance, is an individual determination that's sort of qualitative. One person can, one person can't. But then that somehow the weighing of aggravators and mitigators has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that just seems completely illogical and inconsistent. Um, Your Honor, it's, it's not inconsistent. It has to do with who has the burden of proof for what. When the state has to prove something that's going to raise the penalty against a defendant, the state must do so beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's grounded in the right to a jury trial. If the defendant has to show something that might mitigate that sentence, that might get the court or the, the fact finder to step back from that ultimate penalty, the burden is not on the defendant to do that beyond a reasonable doubt. The beyond a reasonable doubt statu a standard as it relates to the weighing, again, has to do with the certitude that you bring to that conclusion, these aggravators outweigh these mitigators. Didn't we it's reject and foster that these elements that you're talking about, the, the weighing factors are are in fact elements um, rather than sentencing factors, um, don't fall within the apprentice line of cases and therefore do not have, uh, are not required to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, Your Honor, I, I wouldn't, I think if you read uh, Foster that way, if you take it to that extreme, it's, it's clearly uh, not uh, concurrent with Apprendi in the line of cases. And didn't, that's of course why it's being, didn't quote, it's being sought now. Didn't quoting Winship, we say that beyond a reasonable doubt standard only extends to every element of a crime, every fact necessary to constitute that which is charged. And then we said that the Hearst penalty findings are not elements of capital first degree murder and the jury properly considered those elements under- Your Honor, I, I would agree that they are not the elements of a crime of first degree murder. Um, but under Apprendi and that whole line of cases, including Ring, including Hearst v. Florida, uh, a finding does not have to be on limited to one of the original elements of the charged crime for it to be a finding that increases the maximum penalty available. Didn't we reject this very argument in Foster, following both Perry and in Hearst? Uh, Your Honor, I, again, I, I don't think it's necessary to read Foster that broadly. Of course, you may understand it better than I do, but I think if that's how you intend Foster, then, then Foster is in direct conflict with Apprendi in that line of cases, which, which make absolutely clear that a sentencing consideration that enhances the maximum penalty has to be found beyond a reasonable doubt, even if it's not uh, an element of the original crime. How do we square that with our, our jury instruction case where this specific argument argument was brought to our attention by uh, some very sophisticated litigants, um, and this court unanimously, I believe, or almost unanimously, rejected that and adopted the instructions that were actually given in this case. Uh, the court uh, adopted a set of instructions without specifically ruling on this issue or expressing an opinion one way or another. Well, someone asked us to add beyond a reasonable doubt to the exact, the exact factors that you're talking about, and we did not do so. That's right. correct, but again, without explanation. And so I, I think you, your honors would, would agree that when the court does not provide a rationale for something, we, we, that, that it may be it's still arguable later on, basically. Can we also assume that we considered it and rejected it? Uh, that, that has happened in the context of other jury instructions where the court has, has actually explained why um, some change was accepted or, or not accepted. Um, in, in this case, we do know you're correct that, those, that, those, uh, that language was discussed or at least proposed in connection with those factors. Um, I went back and watched the oral argument on those jury instructions and uh, it seemed to me that, that where it was really sticking was again on that ultimate weighing decision, the mercy de decision, and whether that was susceptible of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, um, which, is not a, which is not what we're urging here today. We're talking about the weighing decision, the certitude that the aggravators outweigh the mit mitigators, and then the finding that those aggravators are sufficient to justify death. 
Um, and I, I would also just cite the, the language in the um, jury instruction decision, uh, which is in all of all of this court's decisions, I believe, um, issuing jury instructions that that nothing in that opinion forecloses uh, additional challenges to the injury, jury instructions. So I don't think the argument that we're making here is foreclosed in any way by the fact that the court adopted those standard instructions. What, what do we make of the, the U.S. Supreme Court statement in Carr um, that the, the weighing element, the, the quote, ultimate question whether mitigating circumstances outweigh aggravating circumstances is mostly a question of mercy, the quality of which, as we know, is not strained. It would mean nothing, we think, to tell the jury that the defendants must deserve mercy beyond a reasonable doubt or must more than likely or not deserve it. Um, isn't that exactly the concern that we're talking about here? It's not subject to a standard of proof? It is the concern, Your Honor, um, but it is a concern raised in the context of a different statutory scheme. What we have here in the Florida statute post-2016 is a system where the Florida legislature gave certain findings to the jury before that mercy decision can be made. So there are statutory schemes where once an aggravator is found, everything else becomes a question of mercy. Here, we have a system where merely finding that aggravator is no longer enough. It's, it's, that's shown by the way the sections of the statute work together. Yeah, but even the mercy determination is statutory now after the, the change is made, correct? Correct. So why would that not be a, a fact? You've now conceded, I think, that that is not subject to beyond a reasonable doubt. Why, if that's part of the statutory scheme, um, is that treated any differently than any of the other post-aggravating factor determinations? Because the other determinations are findings that have to be made before death can be considered. That's Once true you get to the point where true. you're considering death, then you're in a different category. But it's true of the mercy consideration too. Death cannot be considered by the trial judge, cannot be imposed until the jury determines that there should not be mercy, correct? Unanimously. That's, that's true. So how is it any the, different? But the, the difference there is that the, the judicial decision at that point becomes really an additional layer of mercy. Um, we don't have a judicial override where a jury can recommend life and a judge can still recommend death as, or impose death as they still have in Alabama, I believe. I'm just having trouble understanding how in, in Kansas, where there needs to be, before death can be imposed, a weighing that, that is not susceptible to a standard of proof, but, but this somehow, our scheme somehow is. I'm having trouble reconciling that. It, it has to do, Your Honor, just with, with where you draw the line between when that death penalty truly becomes available under the particular state statute. In many state statutes, you have uh, aggravators that are built in uh, to the definition of murder, for example, so that the, the charging itself um, leads to uh, limiting the cases to which the death penalty can be imposed. Um, in Florida, we do that by having aggravating factors that have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And since 2016, these additional jury findings that, that Hearst and Perry both said had to be made unanimously. And, and uh, Perry directly said beyond a reasonable doubt by you, a unanimous You argue jury. in your brief that um, Foster is inconsistent with Hearst v. State and Perry, and you're arguing that now. Yes, well, with the entire Apprendi line of cases. Okay, well, I agree with you that it's inconsistent with Hearst v. State and with, with Perry, that Foster mm -hmm. is. Um, Perry is the, the later pronouncement in 2018. Assuming that Perry is correct, that we believe that Perry is correct, would it be helpful to clarify what parts of Hearst were wrong, Hearst v. State and Perry? Oh. Because, I mean, it's obviously confusing if we have inconsistent pronouncements and we haven't said explicitly that one is wrong. Yes, that would be helpful, I think, to, to all it against Your Honor. And I, I think that, that Foster has to be limited to be brought into uh, the scope of the existing case law on what has to be found beyond a reasonable doubt by a unanimous jury. Um, I think that the court recently uh, issued another decision, the Brown decision, um, which I believe Your Honor wrote that opinion, um, which involves the Apprendi line of cases and reiterates the court's adherence to Apprendi. I think that decision uh, actually provides some analogous 
uh, circumstances to the situation we have here, because there you had a crime that was subjected to a theoretical range of sentences uh, of third degree felony, so it could get anything up to five years, but then you had a statute requiring looking at the criminal punishment code and then requiring a separate finding of potential dangers to the public if a lower CPC sentence was imposed. So you had the theoretical range, just like we do here. Once you're charged with certain first degree murders, the theoretical range is all the way up to death. Once, once a death panel is impaneled, that's your theoretical range. But there are certain things that have to be proven before that sentence can even be considered. And as the court said in, in Brown, those things have to be found by a jury. Uh, and it's, it's our position that if it's a jury finding, uh, it clearly requires unanimity, and, and we believe it requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt before you move into the more discretionary part of sentencing. Um, I believe I'm into my rebuttal time, you Your Honor, so I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. Chief Justice Kennedy, Justices of the Court, may it please the Court. My name is Jennifer Donahue. I'm an Assistant Attorney General, and I represent the state in this case. This court should affirm the sentence in this case because there was no jury instruction error as a burden of proof is not required for sufficiency in weighing and the trial court properly considered and rejected the non-binding sentencing recommendation. It, our statute is very clear that the eligibility for a death sentence occurs upon the finding of at least one aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> After that, the jury considers uh, whether mitigation outweighs the, um, the aggravators. And these considerations are just like considerations that any judge would make in sentencing. Judges' considerations in sentencing are not made beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't assign a burden of proof to that. Um, it's determining which sentence is appropriate. So once the defendant becomes eligible for a death sentence, the jury is then deciding which sentence is appropriate in the case. The second issue was whether the court um, should have made a non-binding sentencing recommendation. Um, as I recited in my brief, the court stated that it could make that recommendation, but decided that it was not appropriate in this case. What, what do we do with Perry, though, which seems to be inconsistent with what you've just articulated here? And perhaps it is inconsistent or Would you agree that unclear. it is? Yes, I, I believe that it's inarticulately written, and it would help all parties to more clearly and explicitly explain that um, the findings of weighing and sufficiency are not required to have a bar burden of proof. But I think the statute itself is, is clear enough that... Is there a way to explain or, or to distinguish Foster from Perry, or are they irreconcilable? Uh, perhaps they seem... Uh, irreconcilable. Um, I believe that uh, Perry... Is, there, is, is it possible to distinguish them because Foster was interpreting a pre-statutory uh, case that the statute had changed since Foster? Um, Perhaps that's one way that it could be distinguishable. Um, but I, I believe Perry um, was merely inarticulate in saying that there were elements rather than findings. And perhaps the distinguishing um, feature is that the court meant to say that these are jury findings. Well, let me ask you made. this. If they are elements, do you agree that if we were to find them to be elements, would you agree that they would have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes, okay. I would agree with that. Uh, but so the key is, are they elements or are they not? That's where this rises or falls. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, but they certainly don't increase the punishment. Um, they're downward departures, so there's no reason that they should be considered elements under the Apprendi line of cases. Um, the only other state that has made that determination is Delaware, and they um, read Hirsch v. Florida very broadly, as they stated in their, in their opinion. What, um, what's the best statutory argument you have for the proposition you've laid out, which is that only the aggravating factor element uh, or determination is an element which is subject to proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, you stated that that's what our statute says. Where in the statute would we find that that's solely the gateway for which you were eligible for the death penalty and the rest of them, rest of the determinations are not 
uh, elements for which you are eligible for the death penalty? Um, at 921-141-2B2, it specifically states that a defendant becomes eligible upon the unanimous finding beyond a reasonable doubt of one, at least one aggravating factor. And, you know, the requirement for beyond a reasonable doubt for aggravating factors has um, appeared in the case law since the early 80s, so that's been something that we've been doing all along. Pending any other questions from this court, this court should affirm the sentence in this case. Thank you. Um, Your Honors, regarding eligibility, it's correct that there's a, a section of the statute labeled eligibility, but we would say that you need to look at function um, in addition to form when you're deciding what the statute does and what it requires. Um, if you look at the standard jury instruction and verdict form that this court approved um, and, and which was used, a uh, version which was used in this case, the way that that walks the jury through the findings that it has to make makes very clear that death is not considered considered until those additional findings are made. And in fact, in the, the jury form, uh, I, the word eligibility is attached to Isn't there a the distinction? final finding. I'm sorry, I apologize for interrupting. Isn't there a distinction between determinations which uh, the jury is required to make in the course of its deliberations versus statutory eligibility for death as, as you articulated uh, from the Brown case? Um, in other words, what, what, what Apprendi says is, only where the sentence is the maximum sentence could increase or decrease based on a finding, that finding has to be made beyond a reasonable doubt and, and is an element of the case. Isn't our statute saying that that what what increases the from mandatory life to death is the finding of an aggravator, and everything after that is whether we should or shouldn't? I I, I would disagree with that. I would say why, that why under that? The, the the new statute, the the statute since 2016, those additional findings are prerequisites to even considering death. That it doesn't become but, available. I mean, the recommendation, the unanimous recommendation, is a prerequisite, right? The re the that yeah, is I mean, the, as the you said the mercy the mercy decision. Yes, and I would I would I agree, yeah, Your Honor, that okay. that's not susceptible. Uh, of proof beyond a reasonable okay. doubt because that's a judgment call that incorporates you know, a holistic view and has to be individualized but, to each juror. I, I guess but, what I'm having trouble is if that is the case and that is in the same statutory scheme and is treated the same as the weighing and the sufficiency factors, why would that one be treated differently and not susceptible to a standard of proof but the others are a susceptible proof in our elements. Because it's the final step in the jury's determination. It, it, it is the decision that the jury makes but as a matter about of reading, what sentence should be imposed as, as opposed to what has to be true before death. But as a matter of reading the statute, they're not treated any differently, are they? Um, I, I would argue that they are because if you don't get the initial findings, you don't proceed all the way to that that's final That's true of mercy, though. But that's true of mercy. You don't go any further if the mercy finding isn't made unanimously, right? That's, that's correct. Then again, I'm, I'm just having trouble. If that is not susceptible to a standard of proof, and I agree with you, it can't be. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. I would I, just. I would say, Your Honor, because that's the ultimate question that that the fact finder has to decide, and, and it could it could end there. And we have we happen to have a procedure where the judge then has to impose the sentence and can impose a lesser sentence. Um, but the, the actual sentence that has been imposed at that point is what the jury uh, recommends unless the judge backs down from it. Um, that, that becomes well, that. I, I'm, I'm just struggling to see how uh, these determinations um, are findings of fact um, as opposed to being basically making judgment calls, both the final step and the step before that. I mean, I'm just qualitatively, they they're, seem very they're similar. Not, Your Honor, they're not findings of fact in the sense of did the defendant use a gun, did the defendant fire three shots, but they are but findings. But isn't Apprendi and the whole line from the U.S. Supreme Court about findings of fact? That well, but a lot, of, a, lot of the, a lot of times those findings have to do with things like intent that are not objective facts but which have to be inferred from. Still findings from of fact. Once the jury decides that somebody had a specific intent, I believe in, in Apprendi there was a, a bias statute at issue, so once the jury decided that there was bias, then that, that became a fact. Uh, and here, once the jury decides that the aggravators outweigh the mitigators and the jury is, is 
convinced of that to a high level of certainty, that becomes a fact. The aggravators outweigh the mitigators, and then you move on to the next st step of the determination. So, All right. We thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. We thank you both for your arguments. The court will now stand in recess for about 10 minutes. All rise.